Hash tables are kind of the next logical step after learning about arrays and linked lists. If you're unfamiliar with hash tables, I find it's really helpful to start by talking about the problem being solved here. Basically, hash tables are a way of storing a bunch of crap and then being able to access it later, quickly, using a key. So the first thing you might be thinking is, hey, wait, that sounds exactly like an array. And that's a good observation. Let's look at inserting a bunch of crap into an array. So I dump some items into this array here, and we can access the items later using the index of the array. So the important thing to note here is that the key is the index. But the problem is that this is entirely dependent on the insertion order. If I had inserted them in a different order, their indices or their keys would be different. And the other problem is that if you don't know the index or the key ahead of time, you have to search the array to find what you're looking for. Instead, let's try to compute our own array index using something called a hash function. And this can be literally anything, but let's do something super stupid. And we'll take the name, and I'll just take the length of the name, because I said, super stupid. But you can easily see now where they go in the array. And it doesn't matter what order I insert them in, because we computed our own array index. And we can look up things really quickly. If I want to see if Hermes is in the table, well, the length is 5. So I check that spot in the array, and boom, nothing there. Super fast and easy. But there's some obvious problems here. Like, what happens when I try to insert Kif? Well, that has three letters, and that spot is already taken by Fry. So we need to figure out how to work around this. In a hash table, when two separate keys end up hashing to the same index, you have what's called a hash collision, and that's perfectly normal. They can be mitigated against by using a better hash function. Our example used an extra stupid one that you'd never use in reality, and there's plenty of great ones out there, but... No matter how random your hash function is, you're still screwed because of basic probability, and you're likely to get collisions anyway. So just embrace it and learn to deal with it. And there are a couple major approaches that are used in this case. The first of which is chaining, or separate chaining, and the concept is simple. Instead of allowing you just to store one item at each bucket in the array, or the hash table, here's our hash table again, Instead, you make the bucket hold a whole bunch of things. Crazy, I know. For example, you can make each of these buckets its own linked list, capable of holding a whole bunch of crap. Doesn't have to be a linked list either. There's other options you could make this like a dynamic array. That'd work too. Or really, whatever fancy pants data structure you want. The important thing to note here is that each bucket can contain a whole bunch of items instead of just one. The most obvious downside to this approach, then, is that when you're doing a lookup and you hash to that bucket, you're going to have to sift through all the crap in that bucket to find what you're looking for, which probably won't be a lot, but who knows. The other generally used approach is something called open addressing, which is a fancy way of saying that you're going to keep trying new buckets until you find a free one. So in our hash table, if this bucket is used, let's say your two keys hash to the same bucket again, you just move on to another bucket using some predetermined approach. And for the predetermined approaches, well, there's a few basic ones like linear probing, which literally just means incrementing the index by some fixed amount. That's really, really easy. There's a few other well-known scanning sequences like quadratic and double hashing, which are somewhat self-explanatory. In quadratic probing, you'd increase the array index by some nonlinear value. And in double hashing, your spacing is determined by a second hashing function. There's a whole bunch of others with kind of silly names, which we're not going to go into. Let's just cover the basics of how this works. So yeah, you've got your collision resolution scheme, and they have various upsides and downsides. For example, with open addressing and linear probing, lookups are often slightly faster than most other approaches due to cache effects. Watch the video on memory, cache locality, and why arrays are fast. It should be pretty self-evident. But one thing you can probably guess is that as the table fills up, the performance starts to degrade pretty badly as you search larger chunks of the table. The various approaches have their upsides and downsides. For our purposes, it's sufficient to understand that there are two main schemes for resolving collisions. Either a bucket holds a single key value pair, and the collisions are resolved by moving to another bucket, or we make each bucket hold a whole bunch of key value pairs. Shocking. What you've probably noticed at this point is that there's another problem lurking in the shadows here. 
which is that the hash table can be infinitely big. You have to set some fixed size, and as you fill up the table, no matter what collision resolution scheme you use, you'll get collisions, and your performance will degrade, depending on your resolution scheme. Now there's a more proper name for how full the table is, which is load factor. And it's a problem you have to keep your eye on because as the load factor increases, performance decreases, sometimes dramatically after reaching certain thresholds. Basically your approach at this point, assuming you want to keep allowing new items, is to increase the max size of the table by allocating a larger underlying array and then reinserting every single item into that new array from the old one. And you can do this all at once. Say, once you've passed a certain threshold, you can decide, screw it, we're building the whole thing from scratch. Or you can do it incrementally so that there isn't a sudden slowdown. But the gist of it is that at some point, you gotta make the table bigger to accommodate more items. And ideally, you wanna do this before the table gets too full. Now, if your question is, when do we decide to do that? Well, a common load factor is about 0.75. So when the table is about three quarters full, it expands. You can choose any threshold you want. Basically, it boils down to being a trade-off between not using excessive memory and not tanking performance. Sparser hash tables waste memory, but operations are snappy, whereas much fuller ones don't waste much memory, but operations could be slower and slower. So now that we've talked about hash tables, what exactly are associative arrays, dictionaries, and all that jazz? Often you'll see these references, especially in higher level languages. Are these hash tables or what? How do they relate to each other? The short answer is, some people group these all together as mostly the same thing. And it's probably harmless to do so. I mean, the practical applications are generally the same, but that'll rile up the pedantic people. So let's dive in a bit here. So there's something called an abstract data type which is essentially an abstract description of how something is supposed to look and act. Like if I look up an associative array, it's an abstract data type that defines precisely how they're supposed to work. You can see here the operations are listed. You can add, reassign, remove, and look up items using keys or key value pairs. But it tells me nothing about how it's supposed to be implemented, like for realsies, using actual code. It only roughly tells me what operations should be available and the restrictions on them. If I were to say, describe a vehicle abstractly, here's my abstract vehicle, and it's supposed to have some sort of engine, two or more wheels, and seat two or more passengers. Pretty vague. A car might be the most common implementation of my abstract vehicle, but it doesn't necessarily rule out other implementations. They just might have other trade-offs, or just outright be kind of stupid but they still meet the vehicle checklist. So associative arrays and dictionaries, they're the abstract description of a kind of data structure, and hash tables are a specific data structure often used as an implementation for associative arrays or dictionaries. So let's talk a little bit about advantages and disadvantages of hash tables now. We'll mostly compare these with arrays and linked lists since we covered those previously. But hash tables are kind of just a great all-purpose data structure. I mean, there's a reason why languages like JavaScript, Python, Go, and many, many, many other languages have built-in language-level support for associative arrays. They're just useful as hell. Most operations are, in the average case, pretty fast. Insertions, deletions, and lookups are order one constant time. Contrast that to arrays and linked lists, which are fast at some of these operations, slow at others, and it all depends exactly where in the array or linked list you're doing things. So the disadvantages now. First off, hash tables are fast. All of the operations are order one. But if you recall from the video on big O notation, the big O running time of an algorithm isn't everything. For example, on this blog post by Scott Mayers, the author of Effective C++, should you be using something instead of what you should use instead? Scott gives some great examples of just straight up linear searches on arrays beating hash table lookups for small numbers of entries. And remember when we talked about rehashing? So although the average time for insertion is order one, like all your insertions are chugging along at a nice speed, and then it is of course possible to hit that path where you need to expand and rehash the whole table. So the cost of calling functions could be inconsistent if that's important to you. There are some other downsides too, like there's no inherent ordering in a hash table, so you can't iterate things in any given order. So if you require things to be in a consistent and reproducible order, 
hash tables aren't a great fit. I'll avoid babbling about theoretical concerns, which are super unlikely in practice, especially in game development, like uneven hash distributions, which is like, say, your hash function hashes a bunch of crap to the same spot over and over again. I mean, it's possible, so I'll mention it, but let's not lose sleep over this. Finally, let's talk about how to use them, and what better way than to actually go through and show you. If you've been following the channel for a while, I've built a few games at this point, mostly showcasing how you can get really far with really simple approaches, and we can go poke around the code a bit on GitHub, looking at some of the use cases for associative arrays. Here's a good first example. In a lot of these projects, I have this entity class that holds a bunch of components, stuff like rendering, physics, that stuff. If you've used Unity, it's basically a poor man's game object system. Anyway, I use an associative array here for the components. There's often quite a few lookups for components by name, and although we iterate the components every frame to update them, the order doesn't matter. Here in the Entity Manager, I keep a list of all the entities in existence in the game. Those are all just in a big array, but I keep a separate associative array for quick lookups, since there may be hundreds or thousands of entities, and I often want to look up entities by name. Here's another quick and easy one. The finite state machine has an associative array of states, mostly because I refer to states by name. There's not that many. You could just do it with an array, but the syntax for lookups is easy, so I go with associative arrays instead. And finally, here's the spatial hash grid code from a while back. And this is a great example because originally I used an associative array, but here we're using specifically a map in the code in GitHub as the basis for the spatial hash grid. And this was an enormous improvement over doing it the stupid naive way. But at the same time, this is a fantastic example of how these kind of data structures are great as a general purpose, pretty good solution, but can often be beaten out by a custom data structure, which is exactly what we did in this case to squeeze out even more performance. So in general, hash tables, associate arrays, dictionaries, whatever, I just kind of mash them together, sue me. So these, along with dynamic arrays, kind of make up like 99% of the data structures in the games I've been implementing. I tend to just default to an array if I'm going to be iterating things a lot, but not searching for specific items often. Otherwise, an associated array is my other go-to data structure if I need to do a bunch of lookups, but not iterate. Otherwise, at this point, I need to start thinking seriously about being smarter about either my architecture or the data structure I'm using. I hope this was helpful. Until next time, cheers.